Imagine our good old age in community. My name is Ellen Ryan. As a gerontologist, I have been studying old people and old age for decades. Now I am a member of the first wave of baby boomers on the threshold of our own old age. How should my husband and I choose to age well? Long ago, as I watched my parents head into old age, I started to apply lessons of optimal aging for body, mind, and spirit. I have developed better eating habits, maintained and adapted physical exercise to help my body age well. I no longer ice skate nor play squash, but hiking and long distance walking are favorite pastimes now. I've added lifting weights and yoga to build up strength and flexibility. I've continued to seek mental challenges and opportunities to stretch my mind as I continue my professional work and develop new civic engagements. I've begun to explore my potential for creativity by writing poetry and playing with my camera, especially for shadow photos, as you have already noticed in this video. In terms of spirit, I take time for contemplation through journaling, prayer, and meditation. I reflect on my changing purpose in life and my options to create meaning for myself and others around me. My vision of a good old age is changing from a focus on making individual choices early, that is, our aging is in our own hands, to a new view based on interdependence, on connectedness. Now I am inspired by expanding possibilities with communities for an even better good old age. I aspire to an engaged elderhood. Following Theodore Rozak, I want to practice the gratitude and generosity to which true elders are called. With the joy of gratitude and generosity, I want to continue to contribute to society as long as possible. I want to harvest my life lessons so that I can share wisdom even as I experience more and more of life. I want to connect with people of all ages, especially with young people, our future. In retirement, my husband and I still lead an active life with our family in our professional fields and through volunteering. But we wonder what will happen when one of us becomes ill and the other too frail to maintain the caregiving. Like my parents, what happens to the one of the two of us who survives? Isolation is the greatest danger in aging. More people living alone, pushed aside by ageist stereotypes, less opportunity to make contributions. There's a danger of withdrawing inward, losing energy to even make the effort to connect. In fact, progress in Western civilization seems to have created a general problem of isolation and disconnection. As we strive to achieve independence, have our own possessions, and be self-sufficient, have we perhaps lost the essence of belonging? Might we want to look back at earlier generations and societies for strategies to anchor individuals in community with a sense of belonging? I think we need to relearn the benefits of interdependence for all in society, including the old. Aging in community is a choice we can make. More and more, I am coming to believe that we need community as we age to help us maintain our sense of purpose and meaning and to help us contribute to the larger community. Community means giving and receiving, reciprocity. Community means offering the gifts of elders to the world through service. Community means connections with other older people and with younger people. We elders can lead the way to putting the neighbor back into our neighborhoods. We can choose interdependence over the so popular notion of independence. Our aging future is often posed as either an idealistic image of aging in our own home or the specter of nursing home. Building community is a concept that offers a multitude of alternatives for social connections and supports, as well as for housing. Aging and community models can be viewed in terms of social networks and housing. Locally, my friend Donna and I have been holding meetings to create an aging and community group. We'll begin with mutual support, but we are also discussing housing alternatives. Mutual support groups often emerge from groups formed for specific purposes, church groups, book clubs, 
golfing groups, choirs such as the Young at Heart group depicted here. Branches of the Red Hat Society have sprung up everywhere, deriving great energy from supporting each other in their individual resilient aging. The name, by the way, derives from Jenny Joseph's poem. The opening lines read, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat that doesn't go and doesn't suit me. In my experience, one of the benefits of forming writing groups is the sense of connection emerging as we regularly expose our deepest thoughts to each other. I am especially impressed by the village model for creating neighborliness. The village model, based on Boston's famous Beacon Hill Village Network, offers a flexible approach to building and social network explicitly for mutual support. Seniors gather to plan a mutual support network. They elect a board of directors and vote on a structure. Members pay a yearly membership and commit to volunteering as they can. An international village to village network offers lots of support to individual villages. More than 200 social villages belong to the network now and all rely on member volunteers. Many also employ one or more staff members. The most common services offered are information and referral, help with transportation and shopping, household and computer maintenance. Many villages and other social networks make use of a time bank, a computer database system to keep track of the time contributed to the community. In this way, each person contributes according to their individual talents and preferences. Don and I have been gratified by the generous spirit expressed by our peers in our early aging and community meetings. Participants want to learn to give and to receive without keeping track. Villages build strong communities with reduced isolation, ability to age in place, opportunities to contribute, and access to health care and social services. Seniors co-housing is another strategy for building community. A group of seniors gathers to plan their new home together and then recruits like-minded others. The fundamental values of co-housing include self-directed by residents, small private space along with large shared space, mutual support, working together for the good of all, commitment to sustainability through green building and sharing, for example cars, and easy access to involvement in the wider community. Models of co-housing from Europe and now across North America emphasize regular group dining as a strategy to build and maintain community. But groups differ in terms of the intensity of gathering for meals, some daily, weekly, and others monthly. I like the practice developed in one co-housing project of a monthly rotation schedule for residents to host a meal for three to four others. Such small gatherings, spontaneous and planned, build community. Architectural goals for seniors and co-housing include making natural spaces indoors and outdoors for residents to interact with each other, porches, patios, community rooms, gardens, and walking paths are important components of planning. Creating opportunities for spontaneous interactions is what especially appeals to me. As Dom Helder Camara has said, when we dream alone it's just a dream, but when we dream together it's the beginning of reality. Our good old age is in our hands together. This sounds ridiculous, but every morning I go to McDonald's and I sit with all my friends and we have coffee and we sit for like an hour or more and we talk and we exchange books and um, in gardening season, you know, we, we exchange plants and 
it's really wonderful. It's a social, and it's every age. I mean, I mean, I might be the oldest one there, but it's every age, and uh, everybody just accepts everybody else. It doesn't matter who you are, or what you have, or everybody just accepts you. And it's it's a great social outgoing event. You know, <laughs> it's really fun. I've always beat myself up for making wrong decisions, which I felt I've made many of them. But every single one of them has proven to be a learning situation. I've learned from it. I've been very fortunate. Uh, I was, uh, as a teenager, I worked in a drugstore for Mr. O'Malley, and he taught me to, in those days, we made our own compounds and filled the capsules. Each capsule was a different size for a different dosage. And um, we, we made all the cough syrup, everything. There was no over-the-counter stuff. And he taught me, so he felt that I was a natural, and he offered to pay for my tuition if I went to the University of Buffalo School of Pharmacy. But when I registered, my science marks weren't high enough. So he said that if I went to summer school and we did those two courses and got the, the uh, marks up, I could be admitted. But I didn't want to give up my summer with my kids, go, with all my friends, going to the beach, so I declined. And then my dad offered to pay my tuition if I went into nursing, but it was the same thing with the sciences. So I decided that in September I would go to business school because I didn't need sciences and then I wouldn't miss my summer at the beach. Um, wrong, wrong decision. I was a businesswoman all my life and I used my education, but I always wished I had gone to university. Yeah, yeah I have a lot of regrets. But they aren't regrets anymore now that I know how to think properly. <laughs> Um, and something that brings great, great joy to my life is the fact that I have grand, 10 grandchildren and all of you either have attended or are now attending university. That brings me great joy. Right now we're collecting um, winter stuff for the mission in Buffalo. My son is collecting it, and um, just blankets, They, because it's so bitter cold, they're trying to get all the street people into the mission, and they need blankets and jackets and hats and mittens and scarves and sweaters. They had 60 people in last night, and um, 20 extra cots that were just coming in. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one right now. We were discussing um, aging, and it's just enjoying life, you know, being happy and finding joy. Deepak Chopra says, find your bliss. My bliss is my children, my grandchildren, um, my garden, just living. And don't worry about your age. When I look in the mirror and see that old lady looking back at me, I'm shocked. Because I think of myself as very young. Yeah, it's attitude, honey. Just be happy with your life and that you're still here.
entonces las niñas grandes, que eran niñas de 16, 18 años, me ponían un paquito al lado y yo me sentaba al lado de ellas. Entonces las veía tejiendo porque no podíamos hablar con el redador y yo. Entonces yo miraba, yo miraba y una me enseñó a hacer primero que todos los zapaticos. Pues, pues empecé a tejer, a tejer, a hacer bobaditas, bobaditas. Cuando se iban a hacer uno de mis hermanos, y entonces yo le hice pues, que unos zapaticos, y empecé a tejer, y a tejer. Y ya me gustó, y yo he tejido toda la vida, desde que estaba chiquita en el colegio. Era a todos, a todos, a todos, a todos les hice cositas. Veo un poquito de televisión del noticiero y pum para la cama a las 8 de la noche. Y a las 4 de la mañana estoy parada como una zángana por ahí dando vueltas. Yo leo un ratico, eh, rezo mis cositas y leo. Pero ya cuando por la tarde digo que tengo que hacer algo que yo hace. Yo creo que soy incapaz de ver televisión así. No, 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 no soy incapaz. Me parece que no estoy haciendo nada. No, por las tardes, ¿qué hace? Yo salgo de aquí a las 3 y bajo y allá nos reímos con esas locas. Eh, eh, Consejos ahí, eso es, pues, de lo hace mucho tiempo, está hace como ocho años empezó. Y la gente, la gente fue llegando, generalmente no son de aquí, de aquí no somos sino cinco de la unidad, las otras son de afuera. Somos 14, 15 personas a veces. Celina, la torre, Margarita, la Yanita que se hace en la unidad. ¿Quién es otra? A Carmelita y yo, a ocho son de tres. Venimos los lunes a veces, pero, pero las que cosemos para nosotras, pues lo que es de nosotras. Y los jueves nos reunimos, pero cosemos lo que se manda para la luta. Los tejitos, generalmente estamos haciendo bufandas, porque esos viejitos viven muertos de frío en un asilo en el que van a profe allá y visitan el, el asilo de los viejitos y se les hace bufanditas, cafecitas, cositas así, grises para los viejitos, eso, eso es lo que me gusta a mí, que acabo todo el oficio, que hizo todo, dejo todo y me siento tejido. Yo me arreglo la, la almuerzo por la comida, como cualquier cosa, y, y, y me siento, ¿y qué hago? En realidad, y luego que no me saco, sin hacer nada, ni lo que Un, dos, tres, cuál, lo que te vengo a cantar es un poco el show.